a video about religion. What an unusual topic for this channel. Why did I choose to talk about this? Well, you see, considering the name of my channel is Metatron, and Metatron is a, an angel or an angelic being with belonging to the either Judaic or Jewish tradition or some forms of Christianity. Um, of course, I get mostly two people um, writing comments about this. The first category are people who are simply earnestly curious, and they ask me, who is Metatron? Or why did you choose to call your uh, your channel with this name? And to these people I have already answered, and I have made a, a dedicated video to this, why I called my channel Metatron, and you can find uh, a, a link to this video both in the description below, and I will put a link, a clickable link at the end of this video, if you're curious. But then there are people who preach to me, people who just start writing and filling my comment section with these big, chunks of messages where they tell me metatron i like your content i like your videos but change the name of your t of your channel it's terrible it's the devil the um, metatron is 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 satan and that symbol is a satanic symbol and blah 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 so with this video i wish to answer to these people who preach to me and sometimes they even copy paste like Oh, chunks of the Bible in it. So what do I have to say to the people who preach to me in the comments section? Well, first of all, I do understand and I comprehend fully that this video will have a higher number of thumbs down. Why, you might ask? Because I know that among my viewers, there are some quite a lot of people who are intelligent and they understand that, it, you know, they will thumbs down a video about religion when there is a person who's trying to forcefully insert his own beliefs in your head. But if a person is just sharing his own opinions, I think that's something that we all have, all have a right to have. And if it's done politely and in a respectful manner, I, don't, I wouldn't see any reason to put a thumbs down to that, only because perhaps it's not the same thing as I, who, or as the person who's watching the video believes in. But there are other people that the very moment that what you think goes slightly outside of the spectrum of beliefs, it's an automatic thumbs down. It's just a matter of respect. I believe in respect before believing in anything else. You're a Christian? Fine. You're a Buddhist? Fine. You're an atheist? Fine. And please notice that I don't use the expression unbeliever. I think that that is an expression that is completely wrong, even from a linguistic point of view. Because I know plenty of atheists who True, lack a belief in a god or deity, but they believe in many other things. They believe in science, they believe in themselves, they believe in mankind or humanity, they believe in progress, they believe in love or just living a good life. So they do believe in something. I, I've never really met anyone who doesn't believe in anything. So this is why I think it's wrong to call atheists unbelievers. I would not use that term at all. An atheist is an atheist, full stop. And to be honest, I think respect should go even beyond that. Because if you told me now that you believe in the ancient Norse gods and you built your little altar in your room and you pray to them every day, you pray to Thor every day or Warden or Tyr, I would have no problem. I'd be like, oh, cool, mate. As long as you don't come to me and try to force me to believe that Thor has got a message for me, then I have no problems. You believe in what you will. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that really drives me nuts the most is when you have people who, for example, believe in a whatever religion, one of the mainstream religions, and they start ridiculing people who believe in other things because it makes no sense. First of all, you have no need to do that. There is no need to belittle other person's beliefs just because that makes you feel better for your own beliefs. You don't, you're better than that. You don't need that. Be strong in believing what you believe. You don't need to go attack other people beliefs or lack of religious beliefs. There is no need to attack. Secondly, why belittling someone who believes in Thor, for example? At the end of the day, he's believing in a supernatural entity. I would say all religions are based on supernatural entities who do supernatural things which cannot be explained through the means of current scientific understanding. So I think there are only two approaches which could be considered intellectually, intellectually honest. Either we ridicule all religions or we ridicule none. Personally, I choose the latter. Whatever you choose is up to you, that's fine, I'll respect that. But the idea of my God makes sense, but your God is silly, I think that's being intellectually dishonest. I would never dream of coming to you and telling you you need to change your beliefs because you are wrong, because I know it all. If someone asks me about my beliefs, I will share in respect for yours. 
Now, uh, I remember this comment where this guy was telling me how I was wrong and I needed to repent and blah blah blah. And then he started putting up, you know, he started telling me that uh, Metatron is the devil and it's a satanic symbol. And my response to that is, prove it. Prove that the symbols I'm using and the name that I've taken for my channel is the devil. I'm waiting for the proof. If you have no evidence, then your argument will shatter into pieces. That's what you believe in. And I am fine with it. You want to believe that, I don't know, Metatron is a demonic being and the symbols I use are terrible. That's absolutely fine. So don't open a, a YouTube channel and don't call it like that. Don't use the symbol in your home. Whatever you want, I'm perfectly fine with it. And even if you just shared your opinion and you said, Metatron, I like your comment. Uh, sorry, I like your content, but I think your symbol is the devil and Satan, but that's just what I believe in and you do what you will. I'd be like, okay, thank you for sharing. But if you tell me, change it, don't do this, repent and blah, 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 then I tell you, prove it to me. So I do believe that everyone should be respected as long as they are not fanatics who blow themselves up and kill loads of innocent people or, and use a plane to kill themselves and have buildings collapse. Those are pieces of shit and I'm not beeping it out because that's the good term for it. But apart from that, people who just live their own life and they've got their own beliefs, doesn't matter how different they are from what I believe in, I respect them. You don't believe in God, I respect you. You believe in God, I respect you. Whatever God it may be. And then the answer is always the same. They say, I have proof, and they show me the Bible, and they copy-paste the Bible. The Bible is not proof, and I'll prove to you why. The Bible is not proof because some of these people who are like this, you know, brainwashed, they just come to me and they're like, no, but in this passage it says this, 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 and this, and the God chose this specific word, which means these, this, the, blah, blah, blah. They have no idea what they're talking about. And you know why they have no idea what they're talking about? And I'll tell you this so that you can use it with those people who come to you and they attack you and they belittle you. Perhaps you don't know because you've never read the Bible. So you don't know how to, how to answer, how to counter that. And so you're like, yeah, just, you know, they put you in an awkward position. I'll defend you for that. Okay, I'll defend you. Because when they come to you, whatever you are, atheist or religious, they come to you and they start using their own passages and interpretation of those passages. Ask them, have you ever read the Bible in Hebrew? 99.9% .9 will say no and I would like to underline I have and I will share with you I will translate for you some passages now using Hebrew I will tell you I will pronounce Hebrew for you and I will translate it literally and I will not give you my own interpretation because this is respect I will I will just tell you what it, what certain passages say then it's up to you to make your mind okay if you read the Bible and you think that there is a message there from God to you specifically and it makes you feel good I am no one to come to you and tell you you don't know what you're talking about I don't know what I'm talking about when I if I were to come to you and say that I, I have no proof that it wasn't God who talked to you I have no proof that it wasn't so I can't speak for that matter however if you come to me for as a linguist because this is what these people do when they come to you and they tell you here look it says the highest and it's a superlative and it means this and, he, and God chose this word and this expression to mean that they don't know what they're talking about as a matter of fact there are quite a lot of examples in the Bible that when in you if you read the original language it's not using a superlative for example in the case of Elion Elion is the word that you find when it talks about the highest meaning like God highest above and and you know it's a it's a superlative in English it's not in Hebrew in Hebrew it's a comparative it's higher than and then a group normally you would compare it to a group of individuals so um, it's not superlative I'm sorry but it's not but they don't know do they think about the importance of placing commas for example and before getting to the actual Hebrew text thinks of the importance of using commas let's say that I ask you what do you like and you answer I like eating comma dogs comma and my neighbors that's absolutely fine. Now remove the commas. I like eating dogs and my neighbors. I just turned you into a psychopath. The Bible has no punctuation in the original language, just as much as it has as it has no vowels in the original language. So it is a book which already as it is, even if you read it in Hebrew, it's extremely difficult to understand what they're on about. Now take that and change it into another language from thousands of years because 
the Bible is a book written 3,000 years ago, so in the Bronze Age. Now, take that and translate it into a la in a modern language. There is a lot of room for interpretation. Working on these meticulous, very little things, like here there is a comma, and here he means this, and here he used this expression. Sometimes, some of the nouns and adjectives are completely made up in the actual translation. They tell you completely a completely different thing from what's written in the original text. This does not mean that you as a believer can still receive your own personal revelations. I have nothing against that. But you cannot come and tell me that I am wrong because the Bible says this word and that word in that specific situation because you have not read the original. For instance, I don't believe in the idea of God creating from nothing. It's a typical um, Catholic belief, but I don't believe in that. I respect those who do, my mother does, but I don't, and we get along together very well. Now, let's read what the text says in the original language. I'm going to tell you the original language first, so Genesis chapter 1, and then we'll discuss it together. Now, you make your mind. If you still want to believe it, it's fine. If you don't believe it, it's fine. If you're not interested in religion or you're only interested in the linguistic part, that's fine as well. So, the original text says, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve et haaretz, ve haaretz hayetach tohu vavohu, ve hoshech al penetehom, ve ruach Elohim, merachefet al penechamayim, ve yomer Elohim, yehi or, ve yehi or. Now, please let me underline that these vowels uh, that we read now, in, uh, that, that you heard me pronounce, they were added by the Mesorites. So we're talking about a group of um, Jewish scholars who operated in the 7th century and actually added these vowels to the original text with, which had no vowels. So we can never be 100% sure that this is the correct vocalization of the Bible. It's the only one that we really have at the moment. And it's the one upon which all the translations of the Bible, so you can find in any religion which based, it bases itself in the Bible, are based from. So, Bereshit means at the beginning. Bara is what is normally translated as created, although I have to say that I myself sort of refuse a little bit this translation because um, within the, the very concept of the Semitic language there isn't a any word to, to, for the concept and the idea of creating from nothing. As a matter of fact, a better translation for this would be either modify, intervene, organize. These are all better translations for, for bara, but I'll leave that to that for now. Elohim is the doer of this action because, as you can see in Hebrew, you have first the verb, then the subject. Elohim is probably one of the most mysterious words in the history of mankind, to be honest, as far as the concept of translation is concerned. Elohim is what we find translated as God. Now, um, does it mean God? Difficult to say because I, th I would rather leave it the way it is. I would use Elohim in the Bible. I would not translate it. But um, if you really want to translate it, it's, it's the entity that presumably the Jews had to do with. Translating it as God can have two problems. Problem number one, it's going to be permeated by all the different understandings that each culture has as far as the concept of God is concerned. It's just like when you translate the concept Kami from the Japanese Shinto religion into the concept of God. I'd rather translate that as spirit of nature rather than, than God. Because when you say God, for example, you imagine uh, it coming from a Western tradition, you imagine the idea of an anthropomorphic deity, um, a deity, a god which looks like a man, but for the Japanese Shinto traditions, a kami can be a fox, a kami can be the lightning, a kami can be rain. So when we translate um, texts from Shinto religion, we should be careful when we translate it as gods, because of the connections that we have in our mind to what the, mean, the word god is in our own cultures. So, but apart from that, the second problem with this word is that it's a plural. Now, what you need to understand about Semitic languages, and that's again something that most people don't know when they read the Bible, is that differently from English, for instance, you don't just have singular and plural, but you also have dual. So, what is dual? Singular means one. Plural in the Semitic languages means anything that is more than one up to infinity, and dual means only two. So, more than one, but less than three very specific. We find this most of the times when we talk about couples, so for example, the hands, wings, legs, anything that works in pairs. Well, we will find it in this first verse, and, and again, in the case of Elohim, him is the suffix for plural, not dual, not singular. In the book of one of the greatest monotheistic religions in the world, the word for God is plural. The reasons for that, I've got my own ideas, 
you can choose your own you've got loads of people coming up with loads of different uh, interpretations you can say it's an analogy you can say it represents the um, infinity of God you can say that probably could mean that there are that there is more than one God whatever you choose it's up to you as long as you tell me and you tell people that what's written in there it's plural this is what I would do I would tell people okay it's written Elohim it's plural so if you really want to translate it as God it should be gods and, and consider please that often the verb sometimes it's in sing in the singular form but other times it's in the plural form First tell people, then tell them what you believe. I don't like the idea of just changing it in the translation because then people don't know and maybe they will just bringing up all their, their ideas on why it's a singular when in the original language is a plural. And the stem of this word, L, is what we find in a lot of word and names. For example, Rafa Raphael, which in the original language is Rafael and it means L or God, if you want to translate it as God, heals. Gabriel or Gabriel, strength of God, strength of L. Michael or Michael, most angels have the L part at the end because of that. So it's a word that we use every day, but if you don't read the Bible in the original language, you don't know that that's the actual word used there. Et. Et means that it's basically, you can't really translate it, but it's a marker for a direct object. So it's telling us that there is going to be a direct object immediately after it. So we could say from now that at the beginning, the Elohim modified or organized marker Ha Shamayim. Ha is the definite article in Hebrew. Shamayim means heavens, because you know now it says the heavens and the earth. The heavens, although please keep in mind it's a jewel. So here is a little detail that people who don't know Hebrew won't know. It's a jewel, so it's two heavens. What does that mean? Lots of possible interpretations. Whatever you want, I'm just I'm not saying anything any of these, I'm just saying it's saying two heavens. Ve'et, so ve it's the uh, conjunction, it means and, again, et, marker of the uh, direct object, ha aretz, the earth. Although keep in mind that earth is normally pronounced eretz. Here it's pronounced aretz because of a grammatical rule of modi a grammatical rule of Semitic languages which modify the pronunciation of the noun sometimes in the presence of the article. So I just wanted to translate this very first verse to show you how much more there is to the actual translation when you do understand the language. So when people come to you and they tell you this is a single, it's a plural, it's this adjective, it's this word, they don't know what they're talking about. Now I don't want to bore you with technical translation now, so I will stop here with the translation for today. If you wanted, I could make one huge video and translate the entire first uh, Genesis for you. It's the same. But there are many other situations where you find details, the real details, not the details that people create upon the actual translation, which is completely different from, sometimes completely different from the original language, but the real details come from the interpretation of the language. An idea is, for example, when Christ is on the, when Christ is on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The original language is Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. And it's interesting because again we find El, E, El, Mein, God, Mein, if you want to translate El as God. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. Sabachthani, which is um, forsaken in this case, it's interesting because the entire sentence is in Hebrew, but Sabachthani is a verb which has a Aramaic stem within it. Why did Yeshua or Jesus choose to use a verb in that very moment which had an Aramaic root? And I find it interesting because Hebrew is the language of scripture, Hebrew is the language of tradition, but the very part where Yeshua uses a very personal verb towards the maker, and then he chooses to use Aramaic, a word which has contains Aramaic in its roots. These are all details that make the, the reading interesting, I believe. Someone who understands Hebrew can work out these details. So I tell you, ask them the question that you already know the answer to. Have you read it in Hebrew? So this is why I say to the people who copy-paste the Bible and tell me that that's the proof that they are right and I am wrong or you are wrong. To these people I say, you cannot use the Bible as a proof. You can only use the Bible as your own personal connection. But don't use it as a proof. It's not the way it's meant to be used, particularly by someone who hasn't actually read it in the original language. When they do this, they're just trying to be linguists when they are not.
All right then, Noble. Once I hope I haven't bored you with this video. It had a little bit of linguistic discussion in it, apart from the religious part. So I hope it wasn't too different from the usual topics that I cover on my channel. Please let me know what you think in the comments below. I thank you for your time and for the respect you show me in the comment section. And please remember, the Metatron, spread his wings. Goodbye.